Welcome to Cyber Shorts, a LinkedIn Live series brought to you by SecureWorks. In this series, we talk about short, snappy, trending cybersecurity topics. And today I'm here with Keith Jarvis, who's our senior security researcher, part of our counter threat unit team, and myself, Stacey Ladwinger. Today, Keith is going to discuss one of the latest law enforcement cybercrime takedowns that happened last week and coordinated by Europol. The team, along with another with quite a few other command posts, took offline critical malware loader infrastructure that supports some of our most malicious botnets out there. Many of these botnets and loaders are responsible for cybercrime and ransomware activity that takes place globally. So Keith, thank you for joining us on this series today. And maybe to start, could you give us some basics around what is a malware loader, or as I've seen in some articles referred to as a dropper? Right. So a loader, uh, which is short for a, for a downloader, uh, and as you mentioned, is, is known as dropper. Uh, there's plenty of other names for that, but those are the two that uh, law enforcement used in this case. So it's a it's a very specific uh, a type of malware, class of malware, uh, that's typically used at the beginning of an intrusion when a threat actor has not yet gotten into a network and wants to get a foothold in there. So we frequently see loaders used in phishing attacks through spam emails, through drive-by downloads on the web. Um, one of the key things that a, that a loader does is uh, have the capability to load additional malware, but they frequently have different levels of sophistication and some can do you know, basic uh, profiling of the system that they're on. Um, they can send that profile data back up to the threat actors where um, either automated systems or the threat actor or a combination of both can, can make decisions on whether or not that host uh, deserves to get additional malware payloads. And I think what we've learned through a number of these series we've done, you know, a lot of these threat actors are communities, right? And they're sharing. So in terms of these botnets, what type of community is out there? And can you talk about the ecosystem and maybe dive into a little bit about what you spoke about as some of less sophisticated, some are more sophisticated? Right. Uh, so what law enforcement's done here is pretty unique. They've gone after a class of malware as opposed to a specific, you know, criminal conspiracy, one particular threat group that uses, you know, one or two families of malware. So they've gone after these loaders and uh, they went after about five of them here. Uh, they're all distributed in different ways, like smoke loader is for sale to anyone who wants to buy it. System BC is something that you can acquire uh, yourself without paying. Um, Iced ID is one that's used by a particular threat group and is not available th for use to, to other um, groups. Uh, so there was some variety in here. And the, the botnet ecosystem, you know, writ large, uh, is still like one of the leading ways that threat actors get into networks. Uh, it's certainly been diminished over the last 10 years. But, you know, about a quarter of the cases we see at SecureWorks where uh, an intrusion happens and then ransomware comes after that do involve some malware infection at the very beginning. Um, so botnets remain, you know, a, a really potent threat, though they are losing ground to, you know, credential theft and scan and exploit type of, uh, of vulnerabilities. Now, with that background on how these loaders and the botnets all work, can you talk a little bit more about what the international law enforcement really led for this takedown? And how disruptive do you think it really has been in the short term? So in the short term, it's really disruptive. You know, they took domains offline. They took network infrastructure offline. They were doing search and seizures throughout the world. So they were uh, disrupting the ordinary uh, uh, daily lives of threat actors. Um, so, uh, you know, it had an immediate impact and they redirected a lot of that infrastructure to, um, you know, honeypots or, or sinkholes that um, law enforcement and their partners control. So they can kind of gather data on uh, how prevalent those um, those malware families were. And more importantly, whereas somebody may have been uh, you know, infected a week ago and sent additional malware, now with that, that, data, that traffic having been redirected to a sinkhole, um, they're not going to get those additional malware payloads. And I think that does have amazing impact on organizations to keep them safe. Now, this isn't the only takedown that's happened this year. There's been a variety. And as you said, this one was a little bit more unique going after infrastructure versus specific group. We've seen a lot of these, though, stand back up. So what do you think is the long term disruption that these government takedowns are having across the threat actor community? Right. So we agree that the short term impact is great. It's immediate uh, impact because people who were being infected with malware a week ago aren't because that infrastructure is offline. Typically, what we see after these takedowns is in the intermediate term, the threat actors will have enough resources to bring those threats back. 
uh, maybe in a diminished capacity because a lot of their infrastructure has been seized or, or made unavailable to them. But also historically, what we've seen after these takedowns, and it depends on how extensive the takedown is, is that they will eventually go away. We've seen that repeatedly, where threat groups, um, Imitech, Quackbot, will be taken down. They'll make efforts to reconstitute their botnets and come back, but they never come back with quite the same vigor as they had before, and, and oftentimes disappear off the landscape altogether. So it remains to be seen what the, you know, both the intermediate and long-term impacts are going to be, but it's certainly promising. I think regardless, it's made great impact that it is protecting many organizations. And it is amazing to think about some of these takedowns hurt brands of threat actor groups and, you know, whether it's a botnet or others that really does have that lasting impact. Now, on this one, I know Europol was credited for kind of coordinating the takedown, but it really was a collaborative effort internationally across Europe as well as the U.S. Can you talk about a little bit about how these global law enforcement activities are taking place and how the coordination is making a bigger difference? Because we are seeing a lot more activity than we have maybe in the past. Right. For these takedowns to be even remotely effective, there has to be a lot of jurisdictions involved. It can't just be one country or two countries uh, going after these groups because um, these conspiracies are global. The people that are running them are frequently in different jurisdictions. The infrastructure is spread out throughout the world. Uh, so if you were to read the documentation put up by Europol, you would see you know, it was led by the Germans, the French, the Dutch, uh, coordinated by Europol. Uh, the UK NCA and the, uh, the US FBI were involved in, in large capacities. But there were also other you know, law enforcement agencies from, from Armenia to Ukraine and throughout the world that were helping with um, arresting suspects, interviewing suspects, searching uh, homes uh, for, for more information about these, uh, these attacks. So it's really critically important if you're going to have a long and lasting and effective takedown is to really involve as many law enforcement agencies as possible and as many jurisdic jurisdictions as possible. I think it's great. I think we often say really competing against uh, cyber crime attacks is a team sport. And we definitely see that really picked up in some of these law enforcement agencies around the globe. Uh, last question, Keith, for many that are listening and tuning in today. How can organizations better protect themselves from falling victim of these attacks when they're using a malware loader? Right, especially in the case of loaders, which are again uh, seen in the very early stages of an attack. Um, if you have existing antivirus or EDR solutions that can detect a malware infection after it's gotten into your network, it's critically important that you take a look at those alerts, that you prioritize those alerts, and more importantly, take action on them as quickly as possible. What we've seen in past years is the, the, the so-called dwell time of threat actors in a network has gone from um, in excess of five days to where they'll be active in a network before uh, you know deploying ransomware, but it's gone down to below a day um, in the past year. So you really have a limited amount of time to once you've detected a loader on your network to decide, okay, we need to quarantine that system. Any credentials that went out the door with that attack need to be reset. Otherwise you could have a, you know, a full scale ransomware attack within, within hours. Well, thanks, Keith. I think that's great advice for anyone that's trying to protect themselves. And with that, we're going to wrap up today. And I will say, if there's anyone out there that's looking for that detection capability across their entire IT landscape, that is something SecureWorks can assist with. And please check out our website, secureworks.com. And if by chance you unfortunately fall victim to one of these attacks or a ransomware attack, we also have a full accredited incident response team that is here to help. So Keith, thank you. And I look forward to having our next Cyber Shorts on the next topic. See you then.